Now I'd like to describe uh, the activities of uh, uh, in, in the molecular pathology shared resource in the part of pathology to support COVID-19 uh, uh, research. As you know, the molecular pathology shared resource purpose is to enable tissue-based research. We've been pressed into COVID-19 work. Generally, we support some 153 IRBs, 5,000 service requests per year, and a quarter of a, mil a quarter of a million granular services, supporting some 298 PI. Our workflow now is designed to almost exclusively, but not completely, support COVID-19 work in the short term. Our process can be uh, divided into these three bins, a tissue acquisition process, a processing component, and a characterization. You can choose uh, any uh, one or multiple uh, services. The tissue acquisition involves the tissue banking. You've heard about the incredible work in, in the uh, autopsy service, a patient or project specific type banking in which uh, uh, researchers define either the tissue or the type of processing or priority and or destination that might be required in order to fulfill a project. Uh, helping people to extract uh, fallen effects, paraffin, embedded tissues from uh, the Department of Pathology, as well as uh, working with researchers' tissues. The processing inv involves services of routine histology, tissue microarray, macro and micro dissection to enrich a particular population, DNA and RNA extraction. And finally, the characterization slide review we both do internally, but mostly through the cohort of pathologists that you saw presenting cases. Um, we will also support IHC and IF. Uh, I'm working on any protein that you'd like us to characterize um, and or run, uh, slide digitalization and uh, providing analysis software, DNA and RNA quality control, uh, RT-PCR, next generation banking, which I will describe, as well as linking it to data. So what are we doing specifically to support COVID-19? So you can divide it into uh, material and data in this talk and versus uh, the process to access. So first I'm gonna talk about the material and data that we have and then the process of accessing this material. So everything that is done in COVID-19 research has to go through the Columbia University Biobank, Office of the Research led by Dr. Shalansky. I won't be talking about the liquid component of the banking, which you previously were presented by Eldad Had. Talk about the solid component. So as you've heard as of yesterday, uh, there were some 43 autopsies that were uh, done on COVID-19 with 11 of them, so about 25%, which were PMI less than one. PMI is, of course, more than interval. That's an important measure for pre-analytical considerations for either phosphoproteins, RNA, or other um, uh, omic studies. Uh, this corresponds to more than 1,200 tissue blocks across the, uh, almost every organ in the body, and uh, frozen, frozen tissue, about 400 blocks, and they involve the systematic collection of lung, heart, kidney, liver, as well as five sites from the GI tract, including esophagus, stomach, uh, ileum, and colon, uh, with PMI, with postmortem tracking. Um, the project-specific banking component, and so this is done sort of a, a equivalent to our routine banking. This is all done by the autopsy service and the wonderful folks that Dr. Lefkowitz showed. And they also do project-specific banking. We get specific requests to capture organs and do materials in a particular way that would support present or future research, in, including olfactory bulb isolation, um, central nervous system in various regions that... Uh, Dr. Canole does, laryngeal, tracheal, heart, subcutaneous tissue. We've been working with uh, Ron Wapner with getting RNA later immediately sampled by the OB it, it, during, um, uh, after birth, uh, plus, uh, portions of the placenta, both um, fetal and maternal, are put in RNA later for immediate preservation. In addition to that, we have OCT freezing once it comes to our laboratory, to, to the surgical pathology room, but that takes some 24 hours, so this is optimally preserved. Now, um, there are limited number of surgical cases that are COVID-19 positive because the ORs have been converted essentially into ICUs, so only essential research, uh, essential um, or COVID-19 related sort of cases are done. So any event in which we know the COVID-19 status, we bank. And by that, we usually mean that we, we freeze tissue in OCT. Uh, in addition to that, I get weekly uh, lists of uh, the SARS-CoV positive cases in the hospital, and we compare it against all accessioning to COPATH, which is the pathology uh, laboratory information system. 
Um, we look at all cases that uh, have been accessioned after February 1st, 2020, not that there weren't cases before that, but the uh, testing, the first positive test in Colombia was in March 10th. So that's several weeks before that. And then we matched the diagnosis date against the accession date. And we highlight those cases in which the accession date followed the diagnosis. So we know for sure that they were positive. We also match for cases in which you know when they were positive, um, but you, you, know, you know that they were positive at that date, but you, it's possible that they were positive in a prior date. So we also look at within the t accessions within a two week period prior to that diagnosis uh, date. And with that, starting with some 4,500 COVID-19 MRNs, which from swabs, we identified about 165 unique specimens from 119 unique patients. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for some researchers, they're mostly placentas or autopsies, which will be included in the COPAT information system. Uh, but there's a few other cases from surgicals that uh, may be useful for research and they have the, uh, the benefit of typically being uh, procured and uh, stabilized at a very early date. So time, so the, the ischemic time is, is quite short. There are 56 cases that we identified which were two weeks from the diagnosis of COVID. So some of them may have been positive also. Of course, some accessions uh, are COVID-19 positive which have not been tested. And that's something that could be explored subsequently. Now, we work with a team of pathologists that you've seen uh, today describe some of the organ findings in reviewing each of the organs, both in autopsy and surgicals, and you see their names here. Um, and it, we were creating a next generation banking approach. And in next generation banking, we systematically analyze what we capture in the bank. We don't just keep it in the bank. And by that, we each organ is asked to create, each uh, disease or organ specific experts asked to create a list of coded diagnosis. So maybe 10 diagnoses per organ with, uh, in which uh, that could be imported into our database. So it's easily searchable for individual conditions on a block and case level. So when you are asking for a particular experiment that requires, for example, DAD or microthrombi, we're able to hone in immediately on which block is relevant, either alone or in combination with any other condition. Uh, so the identification of region of interest is quite important here. And at the bottom is the sort of Excel sheet characteristics that, that on a block level, on a case and block level we are collecting. Uh, that's what's the case, what's the block, uh, is it frozen or paraffin? What's the organ, its location? So for example, lung, upper lobe. Uh, what's the coded diagnosis? So a particular block may have multiple coded diagnosis, DAD, microthrombi, uh, congestion, and then any diagnosis comment regarding extent and whether they, if they've done COVID issue, IHC is positive. Now, all COVID-19 autopsies and related surgicals are digitalized and can are on image hub. Uh, that part of it is uh, restricted so far access only to the Department of Pathology in order to enable uh, this sort of reviewing, both quick reviewing. Um, separate from that, all of these cases have select cases of uh, select organs which are de-identified, which are uh, available to everyone, which are part of the NIH COVID-19 data hub that we participate in. And that includes everything from lung, liver, uh, kidney, um, uh, tissues, among others. Uh, that are key that all investigators can review. There are, of course, a few negative controls we selected uh, that are digitalized uh, to be used as controls um, for various experiments. Now, we've been provided by the Office of Research, thank you, Dr. Shalansky and cohort, a dedicated COVID-19 lab to do it with dedicated DSL-2 cabinet and dedicated minus 80 freezers. We have a dedicated cryostat. Uh, that we contributed in the MPSR and PPEs, the all essential PPEs. And critically, in the Office of Environmental Health and Safety, in co coordination with the um, Office of Research, established guidelines on how to work with uh, non neutralized specimens. This is the dedicated COVID 19 lab, a little bit out of focus, but this is our, our, the donated uh, BSL2 cabinet. Uh, dedicate, we restrict all COVID 19 frozen tissue into this freezer. Um, we have PPEs and the coveted uh, N95s and, um, and uh, PPEs here that have been provided uh, through that office. So that's the material that we have, autopsies, surgicals, and uh, we spoke of, uh, of the digitalization. Now, what about accessing it? So how do you access this? I need one, one minute. 
Okay, so researchers basically uh, either can have or not have an RB depending upon whether they want the identified material. Um, they if they want to work on uh, frozen material, they have to get a uh, rapid uh, research review team and have an appendix A, a hazmat uh, uh, form filled. You apply to CUB, to the Columbia University Biobank. There's a bioaccess committee run by Jim Goldman. If approved, it will forward you to the organ or disease specific pathologist in order to define the cohort, define what's the appropriate um, experimental part and what's the important controls, define the specific case and block level, which will be sent to the MPSR with a detailed request, the molecular pathology shared resource. The MPSR will contact you for iLab submission and coordination. And it would release things in a de-identified manner. Should you have an RV that allows you to receive it, we will send you the code. This is what describes it in greater detail. I will skip that, essentially what I described to you. Uh, lastly, a few points. Uh, for feasibility requests and consultation, contact the MPSR at tissuebank.columbia.edu or myself, or through the uh, Jim Goldman through the CUB uh, discussion, through the, the CUB request. We will have a discussion with you as to what you need, and we will forward those special requests to the autopsy service for assessment. Liquid banking and solid banking can always be easily linked. We can enable clinical and data linkage, either from pathology, the database shared resource, or anything else, and enable collaboration by virtue of the people who access our material. Uh, we recommend you use the FFPE material that we have, the formal and fixed paraffin and better, because when it's possible, it's more abundant, it's more varied, larger sections, greater correspondence with h &E and safer. Uh, avoid frozen tissue, of course, for many studies you need to use frozen tissue, but obviously it's more limited, poor quality h &E, especially in the lung and less full face, but uh, it requires BSO2 enhanced certification on the part of the user and requires PPE and uh, represents more risk to the personnel. But and forces us to batch the work to avoid unnecessary exposure and cost. Uh, this is the half a dozen laboratories that we supported so far. Uh, we, we gave about 500 sections to about half a dozen laboratories and there's another half a dozen laboratories that are in the work. We digitalized uh, some 1200 sections. Good luck and as all you all know, luck favors the prepared and we try to help you in this regard. Thank you.